You're watching this video, so you already know that the 1985 decision of the Delaware Supreme Court in Unical versus Mesa Petroleum is one of the most important cases in the history of corporate law. Looking back on that opinion today, we easily see its prominence and the developments that flowed from it, as if we were looking at the waters flowing down from a jurisprudential continental divide. Like looking at a continental divide, however, there are two things that you don't see so readily when you look back at the Unical opinion. In terms of legal precedent, you don't see how deserted it was on the other side, before the case was decided. And in an area of corporate law, and to take over defenses that has become fairly quiet, you don't see the volcanic white-hot controversies that shaped the Unical opinion. To bring that background into view, this video presents the recollections of two key Delaware lawyers in the case, Charles F. Richards, Jr. of Richards, Leighton & Finger, representing Mesa Petroleum, and A. Gilchrist Sparks III of Morris Nichols Arston Tunnel, representing Unical. Filling out their account are recollections from three of the most influential corporate lawyers in the 1980s when Unical was decided. Martin Lipton of Wachtell, Lipton, Rosen and Katz, Peter Atkins of Skadden, Arp, Slate, Marr and Flom, and Arthur Fleischer of Freed, Frank, Harris, Shriver and Jacobson. The story of the Unical case begins with the emergence in the 1970s of the tender offer device for pursuing corporate acquisitions. Slata has to be put in the context of um, 1968, the Williams Act uh, was enacted to uh, deal with uh, uh, takeovers on a federal uh, disclosure level. Not much really was going on at that time, and uh, as time went by into the 70s, it wasn't until 1974 when um, Joe Flom um, and uh, a banker by the name of Robert Greenhill at Morgan Stanley represented um, the uh, uh, International Nickel Company and making a hostile bid for the Electric Storage Battery Company. Uh, why they wanted Electric Storage Battery uh, Company is beyond uh, in any event. Um, but it was it was the first time that uh, major companies were involved in. Um, a uh, hostile takeover uh, with major investment bankers. And that sort of opened a floodgate of tender offer activity. Until the Williams Act, you didn't really have uh, hostile takeovers. And so the law, if you will, in the, uh, uh, in the end of the uh, 70s in Delaware was corporate law made uh, largely by derivative suits and uh, and uh, class actions, and uh, the really the phenomena of one company trying to acquire another company over that company's protest really didn't exist. Not surprisingly then, the law about the rights and responsibilities of corporate directors when faced with a hostile tender offer for their company was pretty much non-existent. I sort of marked the beginning of the takeover period, actually just a little bit earlier, around 1977, 1978, uh, when I started uh, as, a, as an associate at Morris Nichols, which was in 1973, the main takeover device remained the proxy contest. Uh, and, and even they were relatively rare, but uh, in 1977, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court decided the Green versus Santa Fe case, and that made it clear that fiduciary duty matters, including the role of directors in Delaware corporations, uh, were, was a matter that was going to be decided in state court rather than under the federal securities laws in federal courts. And right about that time, uh, the more modern tender offer technique uh, began to develop, and the first major case I remember doing uh, with uh, Wachtell Lipton uh, was uh, Carrier United Technologies, and that was in 1978. And from that time on, there was just an ever-increasing uh, amount of, of this tender offer activity, uh, 
which our case law and, and certainly our statutory law had not really uh, contemplated. Uh, and, uh, and so you were writing pretty much on a clean slate in terms of what the duties and responsibilities of directors were and were not uh, during uh, that period. I think everybody had a sense of being a pioneer in, a, in an exciting venture. Um, and when you analyze and, and look at what the Delaware courts did, it's quite extraordinary. And when an unsolicited or hostile tender offer was announced, events unfolded with stunning speed. These tender offers, it was extraordinarily fast because the Williams Act, which was the federal act governing tender offers, basically permitted a tender offer to open and close in 10 days. Somewhere in this period, in the, in the early 80s, that got a little bit better because that, uh, that got extended to 20 days. But 20 days uh, isn't, uh, isn't very much when you think about all that happens in one of these cases where, they, where, you, you, where you're saying, well, somebody makes a tender offer, somebody has to respond, somebody files a suit, uh, and, and then you have to have, you go through two layers of courts, briefing and argument and discovery, uh, and it's all gotta be finished uh, less than three weeks before it started, which is why I said at the beginning that there were certainly instances where you would come in on a Monday thinking you were going off to take a deposition in one city on a case that was a regular case, uh, or perhaps another accelerated case, and by the time the day was out, you were, uh, you were winging off to someplace else uh, to deal with one of these uh, super fast uh, experiences. It has to be kept in mind that at that period, uh, uh, the hostile takeover was a 10-day affair uh, under the Williams Act. Uh, it was all over uh, uh, in 10 days unless the target obtained a temporary restraining order, uh, preliminary injunction, or uh, the target found a white knight who was going to pay more um, there was no time. It was pretty much a panic from the very beginning. Virtually no company was prepared for this. Um, you would get a call, uh, uh, not infrequently on a Friday night or a Saturday morning, uh, and you essentially had to be in court by Tuesday. Hostile tenders not only proceeded at blazing speed, they also had enormous financial and personal consequences to companies and their stockholders, employees, and communities. You know, you don't really focus on uh, a legal issue that you would deal with, whether it's a tender or for a proxy fight or even a contract and so on. Um, until you get to see what happens to the people who are affected by it. And as we uh, defended more and more companies, uh, and in those days, you know, you would fly out to Wichita or Kansas City, wherever it was, and essentially uh, for a few days you would set up in the office of the target and the you know, everybody there, uh, the, the secretaries that you worked with, the, uh, the accountants, the, you know, the people in the legal department, the CEO and the executive vice president, sooner or later, what's going to happen? How is, you know, and clearly, you know, people were hugely affected uh, initially psychologically and then the realization of the impact on them and their families and on the community. Because of this impact, hostile takeovers set up a rare alliance between management and workers, as in 1982 when Bendex staged rallies of its employees in opposition to a takeover bid by Martin Marietta. That management labor alliance created strong political headwinds against the emergence of hostile takeovers. When you, you sort of look at the landscape we just described and the rising tide of opposition to takeovers that did exist in the mid-80s, um, there was what you might call a, a, an imminent threat, certainly an imminent push for 
federal legislation legislating state corporate law, basically. That was what was in the wind. And there were people who thought, you know, takeovers were, you know, the, the product of the devil himself. There were people who actually thought it was a good idea, but that debate was pretty hot. And, you know, kind of looking at what happened, particularly that seminal year of 1985, you, you have to, at least I have asked myself the question, was this a, you know, a protective response, not to a takeover, well, to a different kind of takeover, if you will. Uh, because, you know, we, we had a perception that, I think the Delaware courts had, certainly I had, uh, and many lawyers had a perception that there were some, you know, real pressure points that were developing. I think the, 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 the perception or the insight in the Delaware courts was that they needed to do something they needed to do something that was balanced. They needed to be mindful of some fundamental aspects of Delaware law. But if they just sat back and did nothing, then you know, Washington could show up at the doorstep. So the question became, what could directors do in the face of a hostile takeover bid? And what would the courts let them do? The leading statement on one side of this issue was a 1979 article by Martin Lipton. Uh, the Chief Justice mentioned an article in 1979 that you wrote in The Business Lawyer called Takeover Bids in the Target's Boardroom. And it's probably considered uh, the most influential article on directors having an active role uh, in the whole takeover process, how to respond to it, what considerations they should go through, and so forth. What led you to write that article? And this is before, just to sort of set the stage, there was very much law sort of in this area. What um, led up to it is we became very active in um, the takeover practice um, in 74, and uh, it expanded in 75 and 76. And sort of just as chance would have it, we ended up um, basically defending and not um, attacking. And uh, it was um, necessary in advising boards of directors as to uh, defending against a hostile takeover uh, to answer the question whether they had the right to defend uh, what were the standards, what did they have to do in order to um, uh, sustain uh, from legal attack um, um, uh, a vigorous defense. There's a set of minutes in your article? Yes. That uh, basically look like it's set up to how a board should have a conversation when they're faced with this. What was the origin of that? Well, the, the origin of that, actually, it was modeled on the minutes of the McGraw-Hill Company, who in 1979 successfully defeated a hostile bid by uh, American Express. And, um, but um, we were very concerned with, you know, the opinions we were giving and the you know, kind of the state of the combination of what the law was and what these corporate raiders were innovating on a basically weekly, weekly basis. And the, the board of McGraw-Hill was very um, erudite board and, uh, and very concerned with their reputations and, so on. It, this was two of the ultra establishment companies going at each other, and it was in in the in the media every day. It was a cause celebre, and um, the um, the board insisted on a full legal opinion um, as to their right to defend against the. Um, uh, the, this takeover, uh, and in large measure, the article um, was 
uh, based on the legal memoranda that we did with respect to advising the board and uh, the minutes that uh, the board insisted on long form minutes. I won't get into the debate between long form and short term minutes, but uh, the board insisted on the entire story being laid out in the minutes. I thought that in connection with the article, it would be a good idea to kind of lay out what one did, saying this isn't you know, a, something that you do in every case. This is sort of a pattern that you can look to as to how to advise the board, what the board should consider, and um, what the board ends up uh, deciding. And that's how it all came about. Now, the purpose of the article was kind of twofold. One, I was hoping to get academic support and judicial support for these opinions that we were giving that had no real judicial support. To, that, to date. <laughs> to, to date, and um, which uh, kind of flew in the face of the Chicago School of uh, Economics and some of the um, some of the academic um, articles, but uh, it, it turned out to be just the opposite. It provoked um, a cascade of articles by Chicago School um, uh, people, uh, particularly uh, Frank Easterbrook and Dan Fischel and a young graduate student at that time at uh, Harvard Law School by the name of Lucian Bebchuk, who- His name's wrote, been brought up a few times today. Uh, wrote a comment uh, um, uh, criticizing uh, the uh, Takeover Bids article, and which ultimately ended up in a, uh, a kind of a three different way. Bebchuk uh, rejected Easterbrook and Fischel's position that in the face of a hostile takeover bid, the board of the target had to remain passive, not even look for a better bid, whereas Beb Chuck had one, also disagreed with me completely, but disagreed with them and said that the board should look for uh, a higher bid. In the short fuse tender offer timetable, and in the absence of clear guidance from the courts, directors and their advisors came up with all sorts of colorfully named ways to deter a hostile takeover bid. And it was a very uh, frenetic period, and the reason why it was so frenetic, because you put your finger right on it, is the rules didn't really exist. So uh, lawyers uh, were creative in trying to uh, make new rules that, that favored one side or the other uh, on the target side to come up with uh, new defenses, on the acquirer side to come up with new approaches. And so there was frenetic activity to find what came to be called white knights or to sell crown jewels or to issue diluting stock or make other changes of that kind. In the run-up to 1985, there were a few scattered judicial pronouncements about how courts should evaluate directors' anti-takeover defenses, but nothing remotely definitive. The law, as I recall it, in uh, 1980, in the early 1980s, was very unclear even on whether the board could take an active role or only a passive role in takeover defense. Right. And that, that began to clear up even a little bit before uh, UNICAL. Um, uh, there was a Panter Marshall Field case uh, decided in the federal courts uh, that uh, seemed to put the uh, directors in a, in a role of uh, uh, not being passive, but actually having a role in defending their stockholders uh, against uh, predatory activity. Uh, and, and then uh, in the Delaware Supreme Court, there was a case called Pagostin, uh, that sort of echoed the same thing as uh, Panter versus Marshall Field. In fact, I think he even cited it. Uh, and was the first, first hint that they, uh, the Delaware courts were going to say, all right, part of the director's job is to uh, defend uh, stockholders. Or another way of looking at it more technically is that under our statute, uh, Section 141A, which deals with uh, 
uh, directors having the right to uh, manage the business and affairs of the corporation, that the business and affairs of the corporation included not just the corporation internally, but, uh, but also embraced uh, a role with the stockholders. In other words, the stockholders' well-being uh, was part of the quote, business and affairs uh, under that statute, which is the hook that the court used to get into this area. But how could target directors use that hook? That was the open and vitally important issue of Delaware law that framed the takeover activities of T. Boone Pickens, CEO of Mesa Petroleum. Some people saw him as a green male artist and a poster boy for all the perceived evils of takeovers. Others had a different view. Now, you, you mentioned that you had uh, litigated a number of cases for, for Mesa Petroleum, and its principal was Boone Pickens. Um, I think I counted City Service, Superior Oil, Gulf Oil, uh, Phillips Petroleum, General American Oil, uh, and then, of course, there was Unical. Uh, so you had a pretty good relationship with Boone Pickens. Yes. Uh, and. I guess I met him uh, early on, and uh, he was a very uh, charismatic, really, uh, leader and, uh, and, and quite uh, iconoclastic uh, in, as far as the uh, oil industry goes. Uh, for example, uh, he was headquartered then in Amarillo, which is a relatively small town, and, and he later uh, moved to Dallas. But uh, he surrounded himself with uh, young people, and uh, which was unusual in the big oil companies. Uh, he had a number of young women working for him in the oil company, which was unprecedented in the big uh, oil companies. And uh, he had a very different idea than the major oil companies uh, had, which I can expand on if you like. Well, I think that'd be a good idea. You, you mentioned he had this idea. Yeah. He had a philosophy about what they should be doing. Yes, I mean, he thought that they had moved from, they were mostly were started by entrepreneurs and were big risk takers. And then as these uh, companies became huge agglomerations of assets, they had uh, their management changed into from entrepreneurs to uh, bureaucratic. And uh, he felt that their uh, interests became focused on the interest of the, of the bureaucracy or the company and they'd more or less uh, forgotten about the shareholders or returned to the shareholders. And during this period of time, these companies did not increase their dividends, although they had this tremendous cash flow. So what did they do? Uh, I mean, Exxon is a perfect example, uh, but not the only one. Uh, they had this cash flow. They didn't have enough uh, prospects to drill, so they went and bought uh, Montgomery Ward. Well, they had no... Uh, expertise in running that company. That was a retailer. Right. A and then they bought retailer. Reliance Electric yeah. and Engineering, which was an electrical equipment manufacturing company. And uh, he was very critical, like to talk about Shell Oil Company, which uh, spent a billion dollars on a prospect called Mukluk up in uh, northern Canada and, and didn't get any oil. And uh, so what he said was, look, if you don't have a reasonable prospect, why don't you distribute some of this money to your shareholders? So how did this philosophy come to bear on the Unical Corporation? It started out with a prank. Well, why don't we talk now about the evolution of the, of the Unical case itself. Uh, and uh, I don't know if you can shed any light on, you know, how that transaction developed, what were the you know, when did you first find out about his interest in, in doing that? You had been litigating these cases for him. I think the Phillips case was still continuing into 1985. And uh, so... Well, you know, from time to time, um, uh, I would meet uh, in, uh, in Texas in various uh, locations uh, with uh, Boone and the, his team of investment bankers and mm -hmm. lawyers, and we would consider prospects. As you know, they weren't all oil companies that at one point in here, I don't remember just the date, they went after a gold company, Newmont Mining. Uh, right. uh, and uh, I remember vividly the occasion uh, because they pulled a trick on me. Uh, 
uh, Boone uh, called me up and he said, I want to have a, a Unic, I mean, I want to have a, a Super Bowl party. And I don't know whether he told me about Unical or not. He said, I want you to come down for this uh, Super Bowl party and we're going to uh, then, you know, talk about what we might do next. And there also was a deposition taken in an unrelated case uh, going to take place in the next couple of days. So he said, uh, well, look, this Super Bowl party is going to be a Western party. I'm going to have uh, bales of uh, hay around and... Uh, Everybody's going to wear a Western co uh, costume, so I'm going to send the jet up to pick you up at the Newcastle County Airport. And uh, do you have any cowboy clothes? And I said, yes, because I'd taken my kids out to Arizona. So <laughs> I put on my cowboy hat and my blue jeans and my Western shirt and my boots and the whole thing because he was going to pick me up in the plane and the car was going to take me right to the party. So... Uh, Oh, and he also told me the party was going to be uh, televised because by that time he was sort of a, really a popular figure and uh, on television and in the newspapers every day. And so somebody was going to have a, a show about this Super Bowl party. So I went down there and I arrived at the Super Bowl party and uh, there were no bales of hay. Nobody was in Western clothes. All the uh, investment bankers and other lawyers that were there, they were all in their three-piece suits. And there I was, uh, somewhat sticking out. I'm pretty tall anyhow, and with... Uh, uh, Six, eight. Yeah, and with cowboy <laughs> boots and my cowboy hat on, I really stood out in this party, I can tell you that. So he then took me around uh, to uh, the host of the TV program, and he said, I want you to meet my uh, ranch foreman, Slim Richards. And I was then asked uh, whether or not uh, I had any view about the price of pork bellies or wheat futures or something like that. And of course, I had to make up something. <laughs> but things turned serious after that. Did you ever get around to talking about uh, Yes. And then the next Unical? couple of days, we talked about <laughs> Unical. And of course, before you could launch the offer, which wasn't offered for some period of time, well, you had to uh, line up the financing and you had to talk to uh, partners and get people to lend you money and you had to arrange for them to come down and, and uh, then they had to be satisfied uh, as to the uh, merits of the deal. And uh, I, I can remember one transaction I was, I was quite interested in and uh, Canadian uh, entrepreneurs came down and, um, and we were having two days of conferences and it was going to be very, very detailed. And uh, so after the first day, uh, these people said, well, you know, we're leaving. And, uh, and we said, well, why, why, uh, why are you leaving? You know, the second day is going to be the most crucial explanations. Mm -hmm. And the guy said, well, I only have one question. I said, he, am I going to be invested in uh, Perry Passu with Boone Pickens? Yes. Can he get any money out uh, without distributing some to me? You know, no. He said, that's all I, I need. I'm relying on Boone. And, and he, they and their group got back in their jet and, and flew back to Canada and, and uh, said they'd lend us a uh, billion dollars. And I think that gives you the, 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 um, the, 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 the temper of the times, really. Uh, Pickens, by this time, was able to establish and, and get very significant amounts of money based on, on his reputation and his assurance that this was a good deal, he was in for it, so they would go in for it too. Well, with that money, he built a pretty substantial toehold in, uh, in, in, in Unical, something like 13%. I think that's right. I don't know how much that was worth at the time, but I'm sure it was more than a billion dollars. With that toehold acquisition in place, Mesa's tender offer for Unical came next. And uh, once, once he built that toehold, what, what happened next? How did that develop? Well, he then uh, made an offer. And uh, I've forgotten exactly, but I think it was like 52 bucks a share or something uh, in cash for, uh, I, don't, I don't remember exactly, I remember, remember the details, but for 51% at least of the company. And then he said he'd have a, a, a back end uh, of some kind and it would be uh, debt securities, which would be worth the same amount. And so, of course, that was uh, what was then uh, referred to as a front end loaded uh, tender offer with uh, back end, which came to be regarded, at least by defendants, as junk. And uh, 
So the notion was everybody will rush to tender because they won't want to be left with the uh, debt securities. That notion, that tender offer structured like Mesa's offer for Unical were coercive, was certainly how the defendants viewed things. And as we moved on toward uh, some of the activities that gave rise to cases like Unical, uh, it became clear that there were techniques that uh, acquirers could use, which in effect would set one group of shareholders against another or would cause shareholders to have to uh, take actions which might not be economically beneficial in the abstract because they were afraid of what their fellow stockholders would do. And in the case of a front-end loaded two-tier tender offer, which is one of the techniques and certainly the one that was dealt with in the case that we're about to talk about, uh, that was the problem, that uh, whether you really wanted to tender or not, you didn't have a real choice because if your fellow shareholder tendered and the, and the um, acquirer, I'll use the term acquirer rather than raider, that the acquirer uh, got 51% and you had said, well, I really don't want to sell, so I'll hold on. You were the one who was going to get stuck with the risk of whatever was going to be on the back end. And you couldn't afford to do that, so you had to tender even if you didn't really want to. Before contending head-on about Mesa's tender offer and Unical's response, however, the two combatants had a preliminary skirmish in front of Vice Chancellor Carolyn Berger, who would later decide the critical question of the validity of Unical's self-tender offer. This all started off with uh, a lawsuit, um, which now has faded into, into the, the mist, having to do with an advanced nomination bylaw. Uh, and, and we were called upon to defend that. Uh, we basically lost that. It was an interpretation, uh, but it was another piece of accelerated litigation. It was an interpretation of whether uh, a 30-day notice period uh, was measured from the date of the original notice of a meeting or from the time that you adjourned the meeting and set a different date. That's generally what I recall. And uh, we had taken the, the, the more aggressive position uh, that it was uh, from the earlier date, and uh, uh, that was ultimately TRO'd against us. And then by the time that, I don't think that one ever went much further because this, these other events overtook it uh, in, in terms of the defensive uh, tender offer. That defensive tender offer, of course, became the central focus of the litigation. That tender offer appears to have originated at least in part with two key lawyers. Gil Sparks' partner, Lou Black, and Andy Bogan of the law firm of Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher. But the case quickly morphed into uh, something quite substantially different. Um, and that involved a, a discriminatory self-tender. Can you tell us how that came about? How did that develop, that idea? Well, I, 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 know, I, was, I know I was involved in discussing it. Uh, I could not tell you precisely uh, whose idea it was. My guess is it, uh, it was a um, investment banker originated thought that, that they said, well, could we do this? And uh, I mean, people were thinking about all sorts of things, but somehow between the lawyers, which uh, the, the lead guys would have been Andy Bogan, Lou Black, and, and then Lou would say to me, was this gonna fly? What's gonna happen? <laughs> and uh, And, and, and so it, it, it just became uh, a thing to try. And, and obviously, uh, there weren't a lot of other things to try or, or, because this was untried, as the record pretty clearly shows. Uh, there, I think the contemporaneous record even shows that the board knew that it, was, uh, it, it might work and it might not work, but it was the m most intelligent thing to do under the circumstances. And, and it had the advantage of, um, of saying, all right, if we're going to lose this thing, at least uh, our stockholders are going to get a chance to get this higher priced debt uh, in substitution for what they may get left with uh, in the back end. And, and so it was, it, was not just a, it was not just a defense, but it was also um, an effort to try to put uh, value into the hands of shareholders in the event that uh, we were unsuccessful uh, in fending off uh, Mr. Pickens. Because it was always possible, it wouldn't have necessarily been a showstopper. I mean, he could have lowered his price uh, and, and maybe it would have been a, a successful at a lower price or not. You didn't know. Uh, 
But as it turned out, uh, when it was all over, uh, he left the field and the defense was completely successful. But so the nature of the defense was to, to announce a tender offer that all stockholders other than the uh, than the acquirer, the than, acquirer than Mason and, and the acquirer's could, transferees, so he couldn't escape uh, by selling to somebody else who could then take advantage of the tender offer. But right. yes, uh, that, that, that this this offer would be made to uh, to everyone, and it was at a generous price and uh, valued at a, it was of note, but it was valued at seventy two or seventy three when his offer was fifty four. And uh, so it's a little bit of a jujitsu move because what you're doing is you're you're doing a, a two tier. Uh, tender offer, but the second tier, the risky tier, is being imposed on the offeror. You could say that. Uh, what it really was was leveraging up the company and, and uh, in effect saying, all right, it's the equivalent of paying a special dividend uh, to, uh, to everyone except not the, uh, not the person who's causing you to have to do it in the first place. That exclusion threatened Mesa with ruinous financial consequences. They were, of course, scurrying around trying to come up with a, uh, a defense against our offer, and uh, ultimately they came up with their uh, self-tender offer, which was at a much higher price, I think 72 bucks, and uh, which uh, was going to exclude Mesa, which would completely blow Mesa up. I mean, it would completely dilute their interest. In its application for a temporary restraining order against the Unical self-tender offer, Mesa honed in on that discriminatory feature. The discriminatory self-tender was something that had never been tried before. Uh, but there was a Delaware precedent that was relevant, uh, wasn't there? There was a, a case decided by uh, Vice Chancellor Hartnett called Fisher against Moltz, as I recall. Uh, and that formed a basis for many of the arguments that were presented to the Chancery Court. Um, and the Vice Chancellor did grant a restraining order on the basis, if I recall correctly, uh, that the directors of Unical owed a fiduciary duty to all of the stockholders, including the 13% stockholder, Mesa. Is that right? That's right. That was our principal argument throughout that they had a fiduciary duty to uh, Mesa as a shareholder, and in fact as the largest shareholder, and uh, they couldn't take this uh, punitive uh, step towards us. And that was the argument that prevailed below, and the argument that we pressed the hardest in the Supreme Court. Unfortunately, there was little or no precedent supporting or refuting this argument. And the case that Vice Chancellor Berger relied on, Fisher versus Moltz, was a very different situation. Was there any case law on this uh, defense before? Not before really. I mean, the only it? thing that was out there, and both of us found it, uh, was this very uh, thin, I'd say thin in the sense it was about four pages long, an unreported case called Fisher versus Moltz. Uh, which ended up being what um, what Vice Chancellor Berger hung her hat on because that was all that was out there. I think it was a Hartnett decision, but it it had elements of similarity to this, but not really. It was just it was a case in which there had been a buyback uh, tender offer to all stockholders except one. That part was similar, uh, but the one wasn't wasn't trying to take over the company, he wasn't making a tender offer. It was somebody that they hated because he, he had been an employee and now was competing against the company, apparently lawfully. And so as the case went on, people were characterizing it as well. They didn't have a valid corporate purpose for doing it. He was, they just hated him. <laughs> and uh, so, so it, had the, it had the similarity of, um, of being a, a, an instance in which uh, somebody had been excluded, and in this case, uh, it was found to be um, unlawful uh, because in that they, they didn't have a, quote, valid corporate purpose. Back at the time when under Tanzer and other cases, valid corporate purpose was still a part of our law. It subsequently, by the time of Unical, had been overruled and wasn't part of our law anymore. Uh, but that was really the only thing that, um, that was the only case law that, uh, of any substance, and it wasn't very substantive that uh, that we found. It was adverse to us. It was uh, uh, 
Charlie was able to ride it through um, the Court of Chancery, and, and, uh, but by the time we got to the Supreme Court, it wasn't getting, uh, it wasn't getting much attention uh, uh, from the Supreme Court. It was still there to be talked about, but it, 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 was, uh, it was not the biggest issue as we got, uh, as we got down to the brass tacks uh, and the pure legal question at the end. Getting to the pure legal question required resolving some less novel questions first. But as you say, there were other arguments. Uh, you had a due care argument. What was? Do you recall any of the details of that? Well, I do. Uh, I mean, we. Uh, I believe the uh, they uh, Unical talked about how many hours they'd spent in these meetings, and you know, it was a long number of hours, uh, eight hours or something, and how their outside directors had met separately, and so they had a very elaborate uh, discussion. But it turned out that many of the directors were actually on the phone. And uh, so the transparencies, as they were used in those days, and the slides and so forth that they were explaining, which were quite complicated if you looked at them, uh, they only heard an oral uh, recitation of it. And if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, the guy that wrote the minutes of these meetings, which turned out to be 20-some pages uh, beautifully uh, written, was on the phone in uh, London and uh, where the meeting ended at 2 a.m. or something mm -hmm. like that. So uh, we were a little bit cynical as to, uh, you know, this uh, do care show. But uh, <clears throat> both the lower court and the, uh, the Supreme Court really brushed that aside and they said they thought that uh, uh, Unical had shown uh, do care. There was also the question of whether the director's ability to sell shares in the Unical tender offer while Mesa couldn't created a conflict of interest on their part. You mentioned also the interest of the Unical directors in agreeing to uh, tender their own shares. Uh, how did that factor into your arguments? Well, you know, of course, uh, Unical was trying to uh, get the benefit of, uh, of the approval by the outside directors. Uh, I think um, inside directors were seen at this time as a little bit self-interested because, uh, you know, their, their jobs were at stake, uh, presumably. Um, but uh, they, didn't, they didn't have a direct uh, uh, financial interest, uh, uh, but with this uh, self-tender, at this high price, $72 a share, and I think, you know, the market price for uh, Mesa was, I forget how far below, uh, I mean, for, for Unical, it was how far below Mesa's, I think it was in the 40s or 30s. On, uh, so now they had a chance to get $72 a share for their shares, that is the directors and the officers' shares. And so uh, we argued uh, strongly that this made them interested and not disinterested, and uh, therefore they, they should be deprived of the business judgment rule. But and that didn't happen. How these questions of due care and conflict of interest got sorted out was one of the most dramatic elements of the case, which began when Vice Chancellor Berger temporarily halted the Unical offer. So the Vice Chancellor entered a restraining order uh, against the discriminatory self-tender, against Unical's discriminatory self-tender. And Unical then tried to take that to the Supreme Court on interlocutory appeal. And what happened then? Well, the Supreme Court said, uh, no, they weren't going to take it. They weren't going to certify the questions because a uh, preliminary injunction had been moved and scheduled and there would be a more developed uh, record and so they said, uh, we're going to wait for that. And by the way, uh, they said, uh, there are four questions that we're uh, particularly interested in and that we direct the lower court to uh, answer. And I, uh, those four questions are, are pretty key to understanding where the Supreme Court was going and what people were thinking. And maybe it makes sense for me to just say what the four questions were, and then uh, you can tell me what, when you saw that, 
you know, what handwriting you saw on the wall. But the, the four questions were, First, does the director's duty of care to the corporation extend to protecting the corporate enterprise in good faith from perceived depredations of others, including persons who may own stock in the company? Second, have one or more of the plaintiffs, and I'll skip over the, some of the words, in dealing with Unical or others demonstrated a pattern of conduct sufficient to justify a reasonable inference by defendants that a principal objective of the plaintiffs is to achieve a selective treatment for themselves by the repurchase of their Unical shares at a substantial premium. Uh, third, if so, may the directors of Unical in the proper exercise of business judgment employ the exchange offer to protect the corporation and its shareholders from such tactics. And fourth, if it's determined that the purpose of the exchange offer was not illegal as a matter of law, have the directors of Unical carried their burden of showing that they acted in good faith? Now, those are pretty charged. Yes, there really wasn't any question uh, uh, in uh, my mind when we got those four questions as to the uh, hostility of uh, Justice Moore towards uh, our position. And, uh, uh, there was no doubt about it at all because uh, on the certification of the, of the uh, question, which he denied, he uh, had us in his uh, conference room and uh, he grilled us for about uh, two or three uh, hours with uh, none of the other justices present in which he uh, evinced his uh, hostility to base his offer. And indeed, uh, Mr. Pickens was well aware of the fact that uh, Justice Moore uh, regarded him unfavorably based on uh, his uh, judicial and extrajudicial uh, statements. So uh, that was quite uh, discouraging when we got those uh, four questions. Discouraging to Mesa, certainly. But the Supreme Court's four questions and Vice Chancellor Berger's responses to them were very encouraging to Unical and its directors. It turned out to be a great blessing for us, very frankly, because she, was, she then cleared away all these other issues that were in the case. And we want the court to focus on four questions. And those, those four questions were... Um, Does the director's duty of care to the corporation extend to protecting the corporate enterprise in good faith from perceived depredations of others, including persons who may own stock in the company? That question didn't sound too bad to us. <laughs> <laughs> and then the next one was, have one or more of the plaintiffs, their affiliates or persons acting in concert with them, either in dealing with Unical or others, demonstrated a pattern of conduct sufficient to justify a reasonable inference by defendants that a principal objective of plaintiffs is to achieve selective treatment for themselves by the repurchase of their Unical shares at a substantial premium. That didn't sound so bad either, <laughs> given, uh, given uh, Mr. Pickens' history. Uh, and then third, if so, may the directors of Unical in the proper exercise of business judgment employ the exchange offer to protect the corporation and its shareholders from such tactics. Citing Pagostin versus Rice, which is the uh, case that had recently been decided by the Supreme Court uh, like a year before that said the board has a role in all of this. And then D, if it is determined that the purpose of the exchange offer was not illegal as a matter of law, have the directors of Unical carry their burden of showing that they acted in good faith, um, citing Martin versus American Potash. So those were the directions that, he, that, that uh, the court was giving to Vice Chancellor Berger. She answered all of those questions. She answered three of them in the affirmative. The only one she answered in the negative uh, was, uh, could we use this uh, exchange offer uh, to counter such tactics, but that was a pure legal question after, basically after you had uh, found uh, uh, that we had carried our burden of, uh, of good faith, that we, uh, that, uh, that she had sort of found that, uh, that, that, well, she couldn't, there was no proof. She said there was a reasonable inference that uh, Mr. Pickens uh, was in this for himself, i.e. Um, uh, trying to, uh, well, in it for himself, and then, uh, and that they and she found the duty of care had been satisfied. So that was actually a positive development.
To be sure, neither Vice Chancellor Berger nor the Delaware Supreme Court ever determined that Boone Pickens and Mesa were actively pursuing green mail from Unical, a point that Mesa's counsel stressed. Unical had really not raised as a justification for what they were doing that uh, Mesa and, and Pickens were um, the worst uh, of the kinds of acquirers, you know, bust up, break up people who are causing employees to be fired and sent around. I mean, there were acquirers who had very bad reputations. And there was a line of cases that said if you really had a bad reputation, that gave the board much more uh, uh, justification for opposing these offers. That defense hadn't been raised by uh, Unical. And uh, so that was very discouraging. And as, as I'm sure you won't uh, forget, uh, we had one night to put together what was regarded as the fourth Tassin affidavit. That's true. <laughs> and uh, it was about a 20-page uh, affidavit, as I recall, which recited in detail all of uh, Mesa's uh, previous transactions, uh, demonstrating that he never, uh, he never acquired anybody or broken anybody up or done anything. And he'd never taken uh, green mail either. Um, so that issue was sort of dropped. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the court sent the four questions down, but they, they abandoned that issue in, uh, in their opinion. I mean, they did fi find, as the lower court found, that, uh, uh, the, we, that Mesa had some sort of a reputation as a, as a, uh, a green mailer, but the, the bad man defense was sort of dropped. Yeah. Had, uh, had Mesa at any point uh, uh, up to this point uh, asked, made any contacts with Unical seeking a sort of selective repurchase of its shares at a premium? No, no, there was no evidence yeah, of that. There's no evidence. In any event, none of that made much difference to Vice Chancellor Berger when she granted Mesa's request for a preliminary injunction against Unical's tender offer. So then the four questions go back. There's a preliminary injunction hearing in the Court of Chancery um, on depositions and evidence and, and, and so forth. And the Vice Chancellor then issued her preliminary injunction opinion. And that opinion, if I recall, was completely consistent with her restraining order opinion in holding that a fiduciary duty was owed to all of the stockholders, and that included Mesa, and that precluded uh, the selective uh, self-tender. Is that right? She That's right. And um, those of us on the Mesa side of the case, uh, considering the internal politics of the uh, Delaware judiciary, we were quite impressed with uh, Vice Chancellor Berger's uh, courage because it was pretty clear that Justice Moore was trying to guide her to a different result, and she adhered to her opinion of the, about, the, about the matter. She did find uh, due care uh, on the part of the Unical board she found good faith on the part of the Unical board. She said there was, it wasn't established that, that uh, Mesa was a green mailer, but there was a reasonable apprehension of the same, so there was a basis for good faith. As you said, she didn't bite on the interest, but she did hold very clearly uh, on this point of not being permitted to discriminate against uh, a single stockholder in making an offer. And uh, that then went up uh, to the Supreme Court. Went up to the Delaware Supreme Court like a rocket. Well, as I recall, the uh, chancery opinion came out on the 14th of May or thereabouts. You filed, uh, I think, your notice of uh, supplemental notice of appeal that day and your opening brief. Right. I think that's right. On appeal that yeah. day. I mean, it was, all, it was all done very, very quickly. And the answering brief was filed the following day. And the uh, reply briefs, I think, were filed on the day of uh, the day of the argument. So there was 
<laughs> as, as often happened in these uh, matters, uh, you know, on one hand, I would have been sitting there trying to fashion my argument to the Supreme Court uh, in whatever style I used, and on the other hand, I'd be looking at drafts of briefs and they'd be coming across my desk and hoping that I, uh, you know, caught all the typos or that we didn't uh, send a brief that had a blank page in it or anything like that. Uh, but yeah, it was uh, it was a hectic period and it, 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 for both sides. It wasn't any more leisurely for Mesa defending the appeal. And just uh, in terms of the schedule on which this happened, the her her opinion was May 13th. I think it's instructive, these dates. Her opinion was May 13th. The Supreme Court uh, took the appeal uh, and the opening brief in the Supreme Court was filed on the 14th of May, um, one day later. And the, and the court adopted a, a schedule when this came up. Uh, that provided how long for the appeal? Yes, it was, you know, those three or four days that you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, I think you uh, were asking me earlier about how these things were uh, managed. Uh, how they were managed was, uh, I think uh, we got about 15 lawyers uh, present, which was a considerable part of our firm in those days. Uh, in the uh, in a conference room, and we divided up all the work that had to be done, including the affidavits and the and the briefing of the different sections, and then we did that overnight, so that we were in a position to to uh, file our papers the, the next morning. So it was a very intensive period of time, uh, particularly intensive when you consider that the technology which exists today did not exist then so that uh, putting the separate pieces of the briefs and the other papers uh, together uh, really uh, occurred, you know, between uh, 2 and 6 a.m. in the morning. I do remember that there was uh, not much in the way of uh, memory in the typewriters in those days. That made it, it, made it a little difficult. Uh, so the the opening brief was filed on the 14th, the answering brief on the 15th. The reply brief was filed on the 16th, and oral argument was held the same day, on the 16th. I believe that's correct. In the hectic march toward oral argument, both sides had misgivings about how their clients would fare in the Delaware Supreme Court. What was, what was the, your client's expectation going into that argument? Well, you, you know, he, guided by us, uh, I, I, you know, I, hope springs eternal. So he certainly was hopeful, and uh, you know, he was encouraged by uh, Chancellor Berger's decision. But as I explained to him, what we saw as the significance of the four questions, and uh, and the general. Uh, feeling that the Supreme Court of Delaware at that time was a bit more sympathetic to uh, targets than it was to acquirers. I think that changed over time afterwards, but uh, I can't tell you what he thought, but he was certainly advised that the outlook wasn't encouraging in the, in the Delaware Supreme Court. I think uh, certainly on our side, but I suspect on your side too, that that you could read this, uh, these four questions and the other aspects of, of, the, of, uh, of Justice Moore's order as really giving a roadmap for how the Supreme Court was likely to come out on this. Well, I, you know, I, I can't remember being that confident because I can remember not knowing, really not knowing how this was going to come out the day we went in to see the oral argument. I know exactly when I knew when it was we were going to win, but it wasn't until we were in there and Justice Moore had begun speaking that I knew we were going to win. Uh, because this was novel. I mean, this was, this was important. It was different. It was new law. And, uh, and you could never be sure, um, but uh, certainly we had some reason for hope, I think, as, as we went down to the finish line.
But the Unical case wasn't the only novel, important legal issue before the Delaware Supreme Court at the time. The other one was the validity of the then-untested shareholder rights plan, or poison pill, being challenged in litigation involving Household International, in which Mesa's lawyer was defending the poison pill. The poison pill was around uh, by 19... Right. It was around because it was litigated right after Unical, and, uh, and, and its validity was, uh, was affirmed in a relatively short period of time after Unical. Indeed, the two cases have interesting overlaps uh, since the household case began before the Unical case, and the Unical case, Unical case started and ended before the uh, hearing uh, in the Supreme Court on the uh, Moran household case, uh, all of which created an interesting dynamic both for me and, and even more so for your partner, Charlie Richards, who was on one side of the issue, if you will, in one case and the other side in, uh, of the issue in, a, in, the, in the other case. And I think Charlie has reminded us that uh, household was argued on the Tuesday following the Friday ruling of the Supreme Court in in uh, Unical. Right, and I, so. I have never made a practice of uh, going to arguments and matters that I didn't have a client, but in this particular instance, the uh, Moran case was so interesting and uh, that I sat in the audience, and at one point in Charlie's argument, uh, the court pointed at me, said, now last week, Mr. Sparks made this argument. <laughs> what do you say to that? <laughs> and, I, and I doubt that's ever happened before, but it, but it just shows how... Um, how you could step back now and look at these cases and think of them individually, but this was all part of a matrix uh, as the practicing bar and, and more importantly, uh, the Chancery Court and most importantly, the Supreme Court uh, sought to uh, develop a rational uh, construct of common law that would govern uh, in this area where there had really been no law at all before. Mesa's lawyer, Mr. Richards, was acutely aware of the relation between the Unical case and the household poison pill case in both subject matter and timing. The Unical argument, I believe, took place on uh, Wednesday, uh, and the household case was argued the, the following Tuesday. The uh, household case was the poison pill rights plan, so this became the paradigmatic, if you will, uh, defense and in Unical, I was uh, representing the paradigmatic uh, acquirer. And so people wondered if there was some uh, inconsistency between these positions. And uh, of course there wasn't. Uh, our firm and other firms had decided long before these cases that you could uh, represent both acquirers and, uh, and targets. And uh, the uh, devices here were quite, quite different. Uh, but uh, my co-counsel in household, uh, the, the Waxhill Lipton, they were concerned about this and they asked me about it, whether there was some conflict, and then about 10 of them came down to listen to the uh, Unical uh, argument to see whether or not I would say something or the Supreme Court would say something which would, uh, in their minds, disqualify me as the advocate for the to-be-followed household argument. So that added a little bit of, uh, of pressure as I was standing up there arguing. And these were not sleepy legal arguments. They were actively followed by lawyers and arbitrators from all over the country. I think it's worth saying for people who don't know, uh, unlike uh, most of the chancery cases of my, uh, of my career prior to this, we would argue these important cases, and the only people in the courtroom would be the... Uh, plaintiff's counsel and the defendant's counsel, and usually uh, not even a representative of your uh, client. But in, uh, in Unical, the, uh, the courtroom was uh, completely filled with uh, lawyers, not just Delaware lawyers, not just arbitrageurs, but uh, lawyers who come down from uh, major uh, firms in New York and elsewhere to uh, hear what was going to go happen. And the same thing was true the following week in Household, where the argument was held in the Kent County uh, Superior Court courtroom, and there were uh, several hundred people there, and the newspapers, the Wall Street Journal, talked about the stream of black limousines 
uh, coming, they made it sort of a picturesque argument coming into this little town of Dover and, and uh, so there was a lot of uh, brouhaha that was uh, surrounding these uh, cases and that added to the intensity, if you will, of the, of the, of the time. The real intensity for Mesa, however, came from Justice Moore, who dominated the oral argument and the other proceedings on appeal, and whose skepticism about Mesa and Mr. Pickens was well known, especially to Mr. Pickens. And he had a perception of how Justice Moore perceived him, I imagine? Yes, he did, and uh, because uh, Justice Moore had been uh, outspoken, and uh, this wasn't before the uh, event, but I think it's indicative of what his uh, feelings were, is after the event, uh, there was a uh, annual meeting of the Delaware Bar Association, and uh, Charlie Crompton of Potter Anderson Croon, he was the president of the Bar Association. And he invited, uh, just, uh, he invited uh, Boone Pickens to come and speak to the Bar Association because he was this celebrity figure and a very interesting uh, figure. And uh, Justice Moore wrote a letter to all the members of the judici judiciary suggesting that uh, since uh, Pickens was a frequent litigant in the Delaware courts, that under the canons of judicial ethics, they should not attend the Bar Association dinner. And that made uh, a number of Justice Moore's uh, colleagues uh, quite angry. And uh, Chief Justice Christie called me up and he said, I will be, I was going to introduce Mr. Pickens. He said, I'll be happy to introduce Mr. Pickens and sit next to him on the podium. And various other judges uh, brought themselves to my attention and say, we, we distinguish ourselves, we dissent from this uh, suggestion of uh, Justice Moore that it would be unethical for us to attend. Needless to say, Unical's lawyer, Mr. Sparks, fared a lot better before Justice Moore. Here's how he described the oral argument. I thought Justice Moore, who was the only questioner, uh, maybe Judge Taylor asked a question or something, but, uh, but basically Justice Moore was asking all the questions. And they weren't quite softballs, but they weren't hardballs either that I was getting. Uh, the most interesting discussion uh, was with the concept that had come up in a case court below where he was trying to get, trying to sort of probe what I was talking about which ended up being, I think, part of a reasonable in relation to the threat posed test, where I had talked about uh, what, uh, the question had come up in the, in the Chancery Court, what fiduciary duties uh, are owed to Mesa in this context? And I had sort of characterized uh, at one point in that answer, which probably wasn't the best of my answers, uh, characterized it as sort of a springing fiduciary duty, and then I had gone on to make it clear that, you know, we got the duty of care, we got the duty not to do anything illegal, we've got the duty uh, to, be, um, to, to be reasonable, rational, under the business judgment rule. And, and this springing fiduciary duty thing, I guess, had been seized upon a little bit by Charlie and, and interested in Justice Moore, and we, um, we talked about that in the argument. Uh, and um, I think I did a better job in the Supreme Court um, in, in explaining uh, how, this, how this worked. Uh, and yeah, we still got plenty of fiduciary duties owed to Mesa. We just don't have a duty to, uh, to uh, lay over and not defend our other stockholders uh, uh, from, uh, from a depredation, if you will. Uh, and so I remember that, and then Charlie got up, and he was getting a, he was getting harder questions, uh, and and then um, sort of toward the end, uh, Charlie started to wing it a little bit. I think uh, at one point I do remember because I can remember this. He he raised. He said, "Well, we're being deprived of equal protection of the laws." Well, that one was that that was getting a little bit far out there, <laughs> and I remember responding to that one in my very short rebuttal saying, well, Your Honor, uh, this isn't a constitutional case. There's no state action, and I said something else <laughs> uh, uh, about that. Um, 
And then I got up at the end, and I, I actually looked at this, and I, uh, this was, this was, I wrote, I wrote yesterday that this was a pretty good close. I, <laughs> I said, uh, finally, Your Honor, I submit simply that Delaware law in this area cannot be static. I had made that point once before. I had also, uh, somewhere earlier in the opinion, alluded to uh, it, uh, uh, the idea that, um, of something that was sort of similar to what it turned out to be with a reasonable response to the threat posed, because we had the business judgment rule. And that was talking about rationality, and I think I sort of said right, reasonable under the circumstances. And uh, they, maybe they morphed a little bit of that into the reasonable response to the threat problem. So finally I said, Delaware law cannot be static. We didn't have professional raiders in 1964 when Chef was decided, and we didn't have front-end loaded two-tier junk bond tender offers. We have them now, and I think our law has to keep up to date with that kind of reality. I think it, I think in this case it's easy because they, in effect, are asking for a change in the law. And we are simply asking the court now that it has squarely put directors in the position of having a duty to stockholders to protect them from inadequate offers, to not take away the tools to allow them to do that in good faith. With the proration date looming the next day, the deadline for determining which shares Unical would buy in its tender offer, the suspense in the courtroom was palpable. But the tide seemed to be running even more clearly in favor of Unical and its directors. And it was pretty clear that the proration date was, uh, was going to be the next day. And, uh, and the court said, we'll take it under advisement. And then later on, we got notice that the court would be pulling everybody together for an oral ruling at 9 a.m., which is the next morning. 9 a.m. the next morning. So when you left the argument, how did you feel that it had gone? I, well, I must have felt it was better. I, I, I certainly didn't feel that we had been blown out. I, I, I say I still, I, I still know, I can still tell you my present sense impression because I know when I, I know when it was that I knew we had won and it wasn't until the next morning after uh, Drew Moore started his remarks. Uh, so like in all cases, you, I mean, there have been cases in my time that I thought I had won that I lost and vice versa, and you never know. But I, I, I don't have, I, I'm sure I had no sense of, oh my God, this was awful. Uh, at, a, at a minimum, I thought we had held our own, and, at a, and I certainly knew, I, I knew that I had gotten our points out. The courtroom was packed the next morning when the Supreme Court was to announce its decision. We were in the big courtroom, uh, which is now part of Young Conway's offices. It was the, uh, it was the grand jury courtroom. It probably seated a couple hundred people. Uh, and this wasn't the only time they did this, uh, but what they did was bring everybody in, uh, lock the doors, uh, tell people they couldn't leave until the court said they could leave so that people weren't running out to call their broker. Uh, I mean, there were people hired by arbitrageurs to come to these hearings, so they would get the first word. And the Supreme Court didn't want anybody dashing out of the door after the first few words that the court said and predicting how the case was going to come out. So they said everybody has to stay. And I was there, I think, uh, I think Ken Nackbar was with me, uh, who had helped the, on the team on this case. And, uh, and the court came in. Uh, and I can tell you exactly when, I, when it was that I knew that we had won because uh, at page five of the oral opinion after some preliminary remarks where Justice Moore had told people, uh, uh, I think he told people don't leave. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, he said, I'll ask no one leave the courtroom until the court is recessed. Uh, um, and then he said uh, that he said, you know, sort of patted themselves on the back as to how quickly they had acted. And then he began to, uh, to talk about, um, he began his, the substantive portion of his ruling. And he said, Mesa commenced a tender offer for 64 million shares or 51% of the common stock at Unical at 54 cash per net share and announced its intention to propose the acquisition of the remaining publicly held shares of Unical in exchange for securities having an aggregate market value of $54 per share. Then he said, this is known as a two-tier front-end loaded tender offer followed by a back-end merger in which the remaining public shareholders of Unical would be squeezed out by the issuance of highly subordinated securities resulting in a capitalization of the surviving company which would differ significantly from that of Unical as it is today. At that point, I leaned over to Ken and I said, we're going to win. Because 
there was no way that any court could let a monster such as this roam the legal landscape uh, any further. A uh, two-tier front-end loaded tender offer followed by a back-end merger in which public shareholders would be squeezed out by the issuance of highly subordinated securities. Uh, and, and it was delivered It was delivered in a tone of voice by, by Justice Moore that just made it clear that, that, that this wasn't going to be tolerated as part of our Delaware legal landscape uh, in, in a circumstance such as this. And of course, then he went on and announced the, uh, announced the opinion. And it was an opinion that Unical and its directors had good cause to celebrate. The only other recollection I have of that, well, I have, I, the, 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 next, the, the next recollection I have of that uh, day uh, other than other than some very generous uh, congratulations by other members of the bar as I left the courtroom, was calling <coughs> uh, Sam Snyder, who was the assistant general counsel uh, of Unical, who had really been the functioning contact in all of this, and he was he was scheduled uh, to assume the general counsel role like two weeks later because the gentleman who had been general counsel was retiring, and that was all a pre-known thing. And, I, and so this is 9 o'clock in the morning, uh, so we're getting back to the office like 10, but it's like 7 or 6.30 in the morning uh, in Los Angeles. So I get him at his home, and I said, uh, I said, Sam, we won. And he says, thank God, he said, I, I went to bed last night, and I didn't know whether there was going to be a company for me to be general counsel of. And the celebrations continued with another prank this time on Gil Sparks. Uh, somewhere in the next couple of weeks, there was, there was some, it was, it was like an appraisal case having to do with this. I, under, some, under Pennsylvania law, it was, a, it was a very small case involving one or two shareholders in some remote county in Pennsylvania, but I, they, they asked me if I would handle it or if I would supervise it. So I, of course, said yes. Nothing much was happening in this case. And then a, a week or two later, three weeks later, they asked me to come out to the to address the board on the status of this <laughs> relatively insignificant case. And I said, "Okay." So I, I got on a plane and I flew to uh, flew to Los Angeles, went into the board meeting, and got introduced. And it turned out that the only reason they wanted me out there, they, I never did get to say, never said a thing about this case. I, they, they, it was simply an opportunity for them to. Uh, for having me come in and then the entire board got up and gave me a standing round of applause and thanked me for what I accomplished. And yeah. uh, that, was, uh, that was better than any, uh, any uh, bag of peanuts or, or, or champagne sent to my house or anything like that. It was a very, very nice gesture. And, uh, and uh, so I, I remember that. It never happened to me before, it never happened to me after, and it probably hasn't happened to very many lawyers uh, in, in this uh, field of work, so it was, a, it was a great compliment. A few weeks later, the Delaware Supreme Court issued its now famous written opinion, establishing that in the face of a tender offer, a board of directors is not a passive instrumentality, and that it has an obligation to determine whether the offer is in the best interests of the corporation and its shareholders. The court also warned, however, that there is an omnipresent specter that a board may be acting primarily in its own interests and that their actions called for judicial examination at the threshold. It was at that point that the court announced the now famous rule that a defensive measure must be reasonable in relation to the threat posed by a tender offer. Harking back to the formulation presented by Unical's counsel in oral argument. The Unical case quickly disappeared after the Supreme Court's ruling. Unical withdrew its self-tender offer, and Mesa managed to arrange to have Unical buy back its stock. What was the aftermath uh, in terms of Mesa's investment in Unical? What was the aftermath? Well, uh, of course, they were now uh, sort of stuck. I mean, after the, uh, after the uh, Unical was uh, permitted to go forward. We withdrew our offer, therefore uh, Unical withdrew its uh, self-tender. Uh, 
and the Unical stock uh, sunk, and there we were, their largest shareholder, unable to move forward with what we wanted to do. On the other hand, um, if there was anybody that uh, detested uh, Mesa, it was uh, Fred Hartley and the, uh, the chairman of, of Unical and his board, and they didn't want uh, Mesa hanging around as their largest shareholder, uh, thinking up uh, whatever they might do I in the future. So uh, an arrangement was made, uh, and I've forgotten the, uh, the, uh, the, it was a device, but the, uh, that was a uh, tax advantage to Mesa. Mesa sold its stock uh, back to Unical, but on some uh, terms which permitted uh, or avoided an adverse tax consequence. So uh, the whole experience cost Mesa quite a bit of money, but they were able to exit on uh, terms that weren't too unfavorable. Unical's doctrinal legacy may be large. It is one of the most frequently cited cases in corporate law, but its direct impact seems to have been fairly minimal. Thanks to action by the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission barely a year after the Unical opinion came out, the exclusionary tender offer defense approved in Unical became illegal under the so-called all-holders rule, requiring tender offers to be open to all stockholders. Well, the opinion, of course, of the Supreme Court uh, validated this discriminatory self-tender as within the the business judgment of directors and legal to do, and consistent with the duty of loyalty and so forth. Uh, but the SEC took a different view, didn't it, afterwards? It did, and, and of course, <laughs> I, uh, you know, was asked to speak at various seminars, uh, you know, after this and so forth, and uh, the fact that the SEC had adopted the all holders rule, they promote, proposed it uh, a few weeks after the Supreme Court's opinion, and uh, that they uh, adopted it, making illegal a discriminatory self-tender, uh, I thought uh, established, uh, at least in my mind, you know, what we were saying is that this was an extremely inequitable thing for Unical to do, i.e. it became illegal thereafter. Um, and I used to mention that in uh, seminars, that sort of stuck in my craw, but it didn't do any good then, it was uh, a matter in the past. In contrast, Mr. Richards was thoroughly successful in the Moran versus Household case that he argued a few days after the Unical argument. Relying heavily on its then-recent Unical opinion, the Delaware Supreme Court upheld shareholder rights plans. And, ironically, that success led to the poison pill becoming the preeminent takeover device. Ironically, a device that today invariably discriminates against a bidder that acquires control without the consent of the board of directors. One of the things that happened uh, just within about five weeks of this decision was that the SEC uh, announced a, a rulemaking initiative to to outlaw discriminatory self-tenders of this type, the all holders rule. Right. Do you remember that? I remember they had, I remember that happened and I remember saying or thinking, well, uh, uh, I guess we couldn't couldn't do this one again. This is this is a, a one a defense that had a a, a brilliant uh, but very short. Uh, shelf life, and uh, that that basically as a federal matter meant this particular device uh, wasn't there. But if you think about it, it's not a whole lot different uh, than what the rights plan does, which Moran decided, because in those circumstances, uh, the, the the person who triggers the rights is excluded from whatever it is that uh, the rights plan gives everybody else. It's the same. It's the same model. It just didn't happen in the rights plan in the context of a federally regulated tender offer. It happened in a different context. So, after Unical, one had to be encouraged about how things were going to work out in Moran because of the very fundamental fact that the that it, it basically is 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 authorizing inappropriate circumstances uh, under a Unical type examination, which in, ended up being at the end of the game in, in the rights plan context, uh, uh, that uh, saying, yes, you can discriminate if, uh, if 
it's reasonable in relation to the threat posed. Which was the new standard. Which was the new standard. That Unical set. It continues to echo even after you know, tweaks in Unitrin and some of the other cases. It's still, it's still bedrock good Delaware law 32 years later. So the Unical case has stood the test of time. Fred Hartley, the CEO who led Unical in the battle with Mesa, passed away just three years after the Delaware litigation. As for Unical, the company, its 115-year history as an independent company came to an end in 2005, when Chevron bought the company for almost $18 billion.